The scripture <clears throat> is in Isaiah again, 58. Seems like this group loves that chapter. Isaiah 58, and it's verses 6 and 7. Is not this the fast that I have chosen, to loosen the bands of wickedness, to undo the heavy burdens, and to let the oppressed go free, and that ye break every yoke? Is it not to deal thy bread to the hungry, and that thou bring the poor that are cast out to thy house? When thou seest the naked, that thou cover him, and that thou hide not thyself from thine own flesh. Is, uh, is there an HDMI cord I can use here? Is it in here? Perfect. Well, it's uh, truly exciting to be here this morning. Um, it's been such a privilege to work in your community to get to know you guys. And um, I am very, very excited to share this message this morning. Um, before we begin, though, I'd like to ask you to bow your heads. I'm going to kneel um, for prayer. Lord, good morning. We come here today because we want to serve you, to worship you, and Lord, we truly, truly want to hear a word from your throne this morning. We ask humbly in Christ's name that you would speak through me, that all of us would have open ears to hear, and that we would be able to experience your love today to go forth transformed absolutely by your love. Lord, hide me, oh, hide me behind the cross. We pray in Christ's name, amen. Uh, when I was in elementary school, this was actually a fourth grade, I had uh, this teacher, her name was uh, Miss Itzkowitz. Uh, she was a, a Jewish teacher, and I remember one day we were taking this test, and she came in, and she handed out this sheet of paper, and she put it down on each of our desks upside down, and she told us that it was going to be a kind of like a race to see if we could get through the test and to see who could get done the fastest, right? And so it was kind of an interesting, fun little thing, and, and so she uh, explained a, a few rules to us, and... Um, after when we were all ready, we just had our, our pencils there on our desk and the paper upside down. And she said, go, and we all flipped over the paper. And so I began to uh, frantically scribble my name on the top, and then I began to read through the first questions. And, and the questions were all kind of funny questions. Like there was like one where it was like, do some jumping jacks, like 10 jumping jacks. There was another one where it was like, underline this and circle this. And another one was like, raise your hand and tell your name to the teacher. And she would write it down on the board. And there was all sorts of silly questions and uh, things for you to do. Um, and as we were uh, co going along in the test, I, st I started to notice that classmates around me were already finishing. And they had already flipped over their paper and they had already set down their pencil. I'm like, oh man, these guys are getting done so fast. And so I'm working furiously to get through this test. And if I recall correctly, before I finished the test, my teacher said, the time's up. And I had a, a great disappointment, I guess you could say. And as, as she told us to all flip our papers back over, um, she said that this was actually a test to see who would read the instructions of the test. And so we all, we all begin to look at the instructions and to read them together. And in the instructions, it actually said to skip to the last question of the, of the test, which is to sign your name at the bottom and flip over the paper and wait quietly. And she said that everybody who raised their hand and had her write their name on the board lost the test. They, they failed. And so I failed the test. 
But, you know, I wonder sometimes if in the Christian life we can do much of the same thing. We can be doing, we can be working and trying our hardest to, to serve God, to, to do all of these things, to fill our life with all of the trappings of, of Christianity, yet we have failed some, in some crucial way to read the instructions. And God is asking us, is this the fast that I have chosen? Is it, is it to do all of these works supposedly serving God, yet you're neglecting one of the key parts? Perhaps it's not just what we're doing, but why we're doing it. I invite you to open your Bibles to 1 Corinthians chapter 13, and we're going to consider verses 1, 2, and 3. Chapter 13, verses 1 to 3, it says, Paul is speaking. He says, Though I speak with the tongues of men and of angels and have not love, I have become a sounding brass or a clanging cymbal. And though I have the gift of prophecy and understand all mysteries and all knowledge, and though I have all faith so that I could move mountains, but have not love, I am nothing. And though I bestow all my goods to feed the poor, and though I give my body to be burned, but have not love, it profits me nothing. You see, sometimes we think that since we're doing something for God, it means that we have love. We, we talk about love is, is a verb sometimes, like it's an action word, and this is true. But is it possible that we could also be doing things for something other than a motivation of love? You've, you've probably heard before the, the kind of the thing where like a, a square is always a rectangle, but a rectangle, wait, no, I got that backwards. Wait, no, did I? So a square is always a rectangle, right? But a rectangle is not always a square. You see what I'm saying? And, and in the same way, like if you have love, you will have good works. You will be doing Isaiah 58, but just because you're doing good works, just because you're serving people, just because you're doing Isaiah 58, doesn't necessarily mean that you have love or are doing it for the right reason. Doing Isaiah 58 with the wrong motives is just another form of the false fast. There's a quotation from the book, Thoughts from the Mount of Blessing, uh, pages 37 and 38. And this is what it says. If there is no actual service, no genuine love, no reality of experience, there is no power to help, no connection with heaven, no savor of Christ and the life. In other words, if you don't actually love people, God is not helping you. You're not connected with heaven and people do not see Jesus in you. And that's, that's a tough reality. She continues, Unless the Holy Spirit can use us as agents through whom to communicate to the world the truth as it is in Jesus, we are a salt that has lost its savor and is entirely worthless. By our lack of the grace of Christ, we testify to the world that the truth which we claim to believe has no sanctifying power. And thus, so far as our influence goes, we make of no effect the word of God. And then she proceeds to quote 1 Corinthians 13, 1 to 3. It says this, When love fills the heart, it will flow out to others. Not because of, because of favors received from them, but because love is the principle of action. It's just your lifestyle. Love modifies the character, governs the impulses, subdues enmity, and ennobles the affections. This love is as broad as the universe and is in harmony with that of the angel workers. Cherished in the heart, it sweetens the entire life and sheds its blessing upon all around. It is this and this only that can make us 
the salt of the earth. You know, I, I want us to, to feel our need of love because before we can talk about the steps to, to receive love, like how we can have the love of God fill our life, we need to understand our great need of it. Isaiah chapter 55 verses 8 and 9 tells us um, that God says to us, actually, he says that as the heavens are <laughs> higher than the earth, so were my thoughts higher than your thoughts and my ways than your ways. And so God, you know, he is so infinite in love, so full of love that just the way that our thoughts go throughout the day, it's like <sighs> I marvel sometimes at how often they're selfish how often I, I, I don't think about other people. And so in order to align our thoughts with his, well, we're actually going to talk about this in a minute, but it's, Paul says in 1 Corinthians 2.16 that we can actually have the mind of Christ. Imagine that. We can actually have that heart of love. We can actually begin to have our thoughts go in harmony with his thoughts. But it's, it's a daily thing. And we're going to talk about more about that. Now, I'm going to ask this question um, and, and define love. Now, is love a feeling or an action? We hear this, you've probably heard this question before. And um, it's uh, rightly emphasized a lot that love is not simply a feeling. That love is, in fact, an action. John chapter 14, verse 15 says, If you love me, do what? Keep my commandments. Therefore, if, if you have love, if you have love for God, you're going to be doing something, right? And, but, but sometimes we fall to the wrong extreme that we emphasize so much that love involves action that we neglect a very important aspect of love. And that is that love actually does as well involve feelings. And I, I, don't, I don't want to just tell you that. I want to show you that, to demonstrate this to you. I could go to a number of passages, but I want to just go to one in Matthew chapter 9 and verse 36. And it says, But when he, that is Jesus, saw the multitudes, he was moved with compassion. Hear that. Because they were weary and scattered like sheep having no shepherd. Jesus was not moved by firmness. He was not moved by concreteness, but by self-forgetful love. The text does not say that when Jesus saw the multitudes, he was moved by obligation because he knew that it was his duty to win souls for the kingdom. It doesn't say that. It says that he was moved by what? Compassion. Christ was moved by a genuine selfless love for people. There's a story, I don't remember this story perfectly, um, and just for, for clarity, it's not 100% uh, accurate to the biblical um, account, but there's, there's a story of this woman who, who was in earnest with God, and she was asking God one night, Lord, show me your heart. Show me your heart, God. And as she lay in bed that night, the Lord sent her a dream. And in that dream, she was in the new Jerusalem, that holy city. And she was walking around and admiring the beauty of the place and, and seeing familiar faces and friends and people that she knew. And um, it happened one day that she, she had walked over to the wall of the city. And as she looked out in the far distance, out, out from the, the new Jerusalem, she saw a, a thin black line, and she was, as she was wondering what this line meant, she began to notice it getting thicker and thicker and thicker. Pretty soon, she saw that the line began to, to separate, and she, she observed that it was actually a sea of people, faces. And as she, she, she saw this with her eagle-like vision renewed by the resurrection power, she, she began to discern some people, and finally her eyes met the eyes of a young man, and she froze. That young man was her son. And as, as that multitude of people began to, to come toward the city, fi finally that young man broke from the crowd, 
And he walked up to the wall, and he began to put his hands on the wall like this. And he looked into the eyes of his mother and said, Mom, let me in. And the mom, fighting back tears, choked out the words, I can't. The mother woke up, and she heard God tell her, that's my heart. That's how I feel for every single person in the world who's going to be lost. How can it be that God has this heart for people and yet we so often feel like witnessing, telling people that they can be inside that city when Jesus comes? How often do we feel like it's just an obligation? Like we just have to muster up the strength or something to share Christ. Like we've got to grit our teeth or something when what Christ wants to do in us is to change our hearts so that witnessing is not an obligation, but a joy. That's not to say that witnessing is not difficult at times, because it certainly is. That's not to say that our patience won't be tried, because it will be. But witnessing is supposed to be a much more natural response in our Christian experience than it so often is. It's supposed to be more like those demoniacs who who came to Christ. They were transformed, and they couldn't help but tell the whole city about what Jesus had done for them. That's what it's supposed to be like. So why is it then that witnessing is not as natural for us? Why is it that we feel like we have to muster up the strength instead of simply sharing Christ with others because we love them? Well, I can think of two reasons. The first, we do not truly appreciate what Christ has done for us. And the second, we do not love people. Well, how can we fix this? Here's one solution from the book Desire of Ages. It says, it would be well for us to spend a thoughtful hour each day in contemplation of the life of Christ. We should take it point by point and let the imagination grasp each scene, especially the closing ones. As we thus dwell upon his great sacrifice for us, our confidence in him will be more confident, our love will be quickened, and we shall be more deeply imbued with his spirit. What would it actually be like to do this? You know, sometimes we fall into the trap, and I'm not just speaking to you, I'm speaking to myself, because I know how easy it is that we, we read something um, that's like, oh, it's so inspirational. It's like, wow, that's, that's such a good quote or such a good verse. And then it's like, it's inspirational, it's encouraging, but we do nothing. What would it be like if we actually spent time every day thinking about the life of Christ? What would it be like? I remember more re- a time uh, very, very much more recently than I would like to admit. Um, sometime after I graduated high school, I was. Uh, this was back home in Missouri. Uh, in my grandparents' house, I was sitting in my room. I, my room's downstairs, and um, and I was sitting in my chair, and I was just thinking, like, Lord, you know, what do you want me to do with my life? What am I going to do for a, a career and occupation and, and different things? Like, where do you want me to go? What do you want me to do? And my whole life, I, I've known that I wanted to serve God ever since I gave my life to Christ, um, since around seventh grade or so. I've known that I wanted to serve God, but, you know, what, what does that mean? What does that look like? And as I was sitting 
in, in my chair in my room that day, the Holy Spirit just impressed me with the thought that serving God, it means serving people. And I had never quite made that connection before. Of course, I knew that intellectually, but like it had never just clicked in the way that it did that time. And then thought came to me even harder. It almost broke my heart. And I asked myself, do I even love people? When I contemplated the love of Christ, how, how great, how vast it is, and I see myself, it's like, you know, I'm not even close, Lord. And, and I realized, I, I, I cried before God. I was like, Lord, if I'm going to be serving you my whole life, and serving you means serving people, you know, am I even going to enjoy that? Is, is that even pleasurable to me? And I think this is part of the problem with Laodicea, is that we don't even realize our need. We're so, so complacent with life day to day that we don't even realize how low our love is compared to God's love for us. We don't even realize it. And this is why Jesus said on that quiet night to that Pharisee, to Nicodemus, he said, Jesus answered and said to him, Most assuredly, I say to you, Unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. To receive that new heart, it means we need to be born again. And, you know, sometimes we, we say, oh, well, you know, I was, I was born again. I was baptized. But the question is not, you know, when were you baptized or when were you born again? But, you know. When were you last born again? Paul said in 1 Corinthians 15, 31, he said, I die daily. Are we daily seeking to be born again? To receive God's love into our hearts? I encourage you to open your Bibles with me now to Jeremiah chapter 20 and verse 9. I just love this verse. So let's check it out together. Jeremiah chapter 20 and verse 9. This is a very, very powerful verse. In Jeremiah chapter 20 and verse 9. Man, if you guys, Jeremiah, the book of Jeremiah. Man, if, if you guys want to peek in a little bit into the heart of God, read that precious little book of Jeremiah and you'll see God's God's heart for his people so powerful Jeremiah chapter 20 verse 9 Jeremiah speaking he says then I said I will not make mention of him nor speak any more in his name he was, he was tired of <laughs> witnessing but what happened he said but his word was in my heart like a burning fire shut up in my bones I was weary of holding it back, and I could not. Don't you long for the spirit of Jeremiah? For Christ's love for perishing souls is so shut up in your heart that it feels like a burning fire. It's painful to hold back, painful to not tell people about Jesus. But beloved, he can only fill you to the extent that you and I are empty. It's only when you empty yourself completely and surrender your entire life to Jesus Christ that he can really fill you with his love. He can give you that precious new heart that he's promised to the us. Then witnessing is no longer burdensome. It's a delight. However, you cannot expect to immediately love witnessing if all you do is pray a prayer 
and give your heart to Jesus one time. No, character is not developed in a moment. It's not developed overnight. We need to think of the new heart not merely as an event, but a process. It takes daily consecration to God, daily emptying yourself and being filled with His Spirit. It's not so much about the date you gave your life to Christ in the past. The question is, have you given your life to Him this morning? When was the last time you made a full surrender of your life to Jesus Christ, beloved? If you are willing to give your heart unreservedly to Jesus every single day, that is when He can really change and use you. So exciting ways. So, should we stop giving to the poor? Should we stop telling others about Jesus and kill, until we get that perfect heart? No. Like I said, the sanctification of our motivation takes time. If you know how to do good, you should always do it, even if your heart doesn't have perfect motives yet. In fact, doing good even when we don't feel like it is an important part in the process of changing our hearts. Obeying God even when we don't feel like it shows that we love Him, trust Him, and desire that new heart. That's what it means to live by faith. So when you invite your neighbors to your house for a meal, ask God to give you a kinder heart. When you share your faith, pray that He will give you a heart that actually cares. Ask Him to give you pure motives and he will. Day by day, he will bring your heart into closer conformity to his. Now this is the confidence that we have in him, that if we ask anything according to his will, he hears us. And if we know that he hears us, whatever we ask, we know that we have the petitions that we have asked of him. Until now you have asked nothing in my name. Ask and you will receive, that your joy may be full. I'm going to read a statement from the book, The Great Controversy. This is coming on the life of John Wesley. It says, On his return to England, Wesley, under the instruction of a Moravian preacher, arrived at a clear understanding of Bible faith. He was convinced that he must renounce all dependence upon his own works for salvation and must trust wholly to the Lamb of God which taketh away the sin of the world. At a meeting of the Moravian Society in London, a statement was read from Luther describing the change which the Spirit of God works in the heart of the believer. As Wesley listened, faith was kindled in his soul. I felt my heart strangely warmed, he says. I felt I did trust in Christ, Christ alone for salvation. And an assurance was given me that he had taken away my sins, even mine, and had saved me from the law of sin and death. Through long years of wearisome and comfortless striving, years of rigorous self-denial, of reproach and humiliation, Wesley had steadfastly adhered to his one purpose of seeking God. Now he had found him. And he, had and he found that the grace which he had toiled to win by prayers and fasts, by alms deeds and self-abnegation, was a gift without money and without price. Once established in the faith of Christ, his whole soul burned with the desire to spread everywhere a knowledge of the glorious gospel of God's free grace. That's the experience of Jeremiah. I look upon all the world as my parish, he said, and whatever part of it I am, I judge it meet, right, and my bounden duty to declare unto all that are willing to hear the glad tidings of salvation. He continued his strict and self-denying life. Not now is the ground, but the result of faith. Not the root, but the fruit of holiness. 
The grace of God in Christ is the foundation of the Christian's hope, and that grace will be manifested in obedience. Wesley's life was devoted to the preaching of the great truth which he had received, justification through faith in the atoning blood of Christ and the renewing power of the Holy Spirit upon the heart, bringing forth fruit in a life conformed to the example of Christ. This is what it means to live by faith, beloved. This is righteousness by faith. Why do you work for God? Is it because you think it earns you some favor with God? I can assure you, your works do not in the least bring you into his favor. God favors you because that is who he is. All your righteousnesses are like filthy rags. Let me tell you something, beloved. The only true reason to work for souls is because you actually love them. Ellen White adds on to this, in that wonderful little book, Steps to Christ. She says, those who are partakers of the grace of Christ will be ready to make any sacrifice that others for whom he died may share the heavenly gift. They will do all they can to make the world better for their stay in it. This, this spirit is the sure outgrowth of a soul truly converted. No sooner does one come to Christ than there is born in his heart a desire to make known to others what a precious friend he has found in Jesus. The saving and sanctifying truth cannot be shut up in his heart. If we are clothed with the righteousness of Christ and are filled with the joy of his indwelling spirit, we shall not be able to hold our peace. If we have tasted and seen that the Lord is good, we shall have something to tell. Like Philip, when he found the Savior, we shall invite others into his presence. We shall seek to present to them the attractions of Christ and the unseen realities of the world to come. There will be an intensity of desire to follow in the path that Jesus trod. There will be an earnest longing that those around us may behold the Lamb of God, which taketh away the sin of the world. This is what true conversion looks like, beloved. This spirit is the sure outgrowth of a soul truly converted. We're about to land the plane, but I'm going to go to Numbers chapter 13. Numbers chapter 13 now. This is a a very, very interesting story that has um, a lot of end time significance. I don't want to bring out every point that I could, but I want to bring out something that relates. And uh, Numbers chapter 13 now, starting in verse 27. Numbers 13, 27. And this is right after, just to give you more context, they had come out of Egypt. God had given them the, the Ten Commandments. He had shown his visible presence among them. And now they've gone to the promised land. They're at the very borders of the promised land. They send out the 12 spies to, to re- give a report of the land, what it's like. And the twelve come back, and this is the report that they give. Verse 27. And they told him and said, We came unto the land whither thou sentest us, and surely it floweth with milk and honey. And this is the fruit of it. Nevertheless, the people be strong that dwell in the land. And the cities are walled and very great. And moreover, we saw the children of Anak there. The Amalekites dwell in the land of the south, and the Hittites, and the Jebusites, and the Amorites, and the Termites. Oh, well, well, maybe not those. They dwell in the mountains, and the Canaanites dwell by the sea, 
and by the coast of Jordan. And Caleb stilled the people before Moses and said, Let us go up at once and possess it, for we are well able to overcome it. But the men that went up with him said, We be not able to go up against the people, for they are stronger than we. Now chapter 14, verses 1 to 4. And all the congregation lifted up their voice and cried, and the people wept that night. And all the children of Israel murmured against Moses and against Aaron. And the whole congregation said unto them, Would God we had died in the land of Egypt, or would God we had died in this wilderness? They got what they asked for. And wherefore hath the Lord brought us unto this land, to fall by the sword, that our wives and our children should be a prey? Were it not better for us to return into Egypt? And they said one to another, Let us make a captain, and let us return into Egypt. You know, there's really only two types of, of Christians. There's those Christians who take God at his word, choose to live by faith, full of love and hope and trust in God. And then there are those Christians that do not have faith. They don't really believe that God can use them. Don't believe really that the work can be finished there. Maybe they, they've been burned by evangelism before. Oh, I've tried this. I haven't really seen any results. So they just kind of don't do much anymore. There's those Christians that are always complaining, murmuring, grumbling, fault-finding, The Bible says in Philippians chapter 2, verses 14 and 15, Do all things without complaining and disputing, that you may become blameless and harmless, children of God, without fault, in the midst of a crooked and perverse generation, among whom you shine as lights in the world. We can't shine as those lights. We can't be the light of the world if we're complaining and disputing, beloved. Beloved, if you're indulging in complaining, grumbling, excuses, fault-finding, etc., you do not have the love of God abiding in you. Are you burned? You know, I think there's um, probably multiple causes of burnout. And, beloved, if you've been burned before, God understands. He cares. But um, I've observed, and I think, that working for God without that love in our hearts is probably the main cause of burnout. If you don't actually love people, you're not going to find pleasure in laboring for souls, and ministry is going to be miserable. How could one attempt to be a Christian without love? Surely he will burn out and discover he lacks the strength and the character to continue working for God. And what is the product of this terrible recipe a church full of Laodiceans. This is Satan's favorite recipe. You've maybe heard before the statement, success in any line demands a definite aim. Well, it also demands a definite purpose. My peers in the Total Wellness Program and the members of this church. If you've ever been discouraged because you didn't see the results you had hoped for, why were you discouraged? Are you discouraged because you feel like you deserve results? 
Is it because you are concerned what other people will think about your failed project? Are you discouraged because you actually care about people? Are you moved to weeping, not for yourself, but because you actually care to see the people of Decatur, your neighbors, your friends, your co-workers, in God's kingdom? You know, even Jeremiah, Noah, and many other biblical characters didn't see any results. I don't know that they want anybody. But this does not mean that they were doing the wrong thing. It doesn't mean they were failures in heaven's sight. We're not called to get results. We're called to faithfulness to the word of God. Will you by faith follow God's words even if you don't see results? Because you love people? Paul said, oh wait, I might have missed Okay, I didn't add it on the slides. Paul said in 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verses 6 to 8, he said, I planted, Apollos watered, but God, God gave the increase. So then neither he who plants is anything, nor he who waters, but God who gives the increase. Now he who plants and he who waters are one, and each one will receive his own reward according to his own labor. Beloved, if anybody comes to Christ, it's not really because of you. It's because of God working through you. And we're not always called to be the harvesters. Sometimes we're called to plant. Sometimes we're, we're called to water. And sometimes we do have the privilege of reaping the harvest, seeing people saved. But are you willing to serve God even if it's just watering, even if it's just planting, and others are the one who reap. Only eternity will tell the results, the wide results of our work for God. In summary, you might want to take a picture of this. These are the steps to receive a loving heart. There's five steps. We briefly touched on all of them. Number one, surrender your entire life to God. Number two, die to self daily. Number three, spend daily time with God. Number four, ask God for the gift of love. And number five, trust that God is working. Um... There's a story I heard. Well, actually, I, I didn't hear it. I kind of heard it. There's a story similar to it that I know that's true. But uh, one day there was uh, this guy that he had gone for a hike, and he had brought his little backpack with his lunch, and he went out, and he went over to this nice area. There was this beautiful river that went through these mountains, and he went by this really nice spot by a waterfall uh, to eat his lunch. And as he was eating his lunch, he, he, see the, he sees these three little boys come up to this waterfall. But um, it was a very dangerous waterfall because after the waterfall, the, the water gets rushing in super, super fast. And it can be dangerous, uh, very, very dangerous. And so there was a fence around it that uh, had warning signs on it not to go near that waterfall. And the man, as he's eating his lunch, he sees the boys disregard the sign and go anyways. And the man, he had thoughts of, of warning them, and he thought, you know, maybe I should tell, tell them to, to not, and maybe I should encourage them and try to help them from endangering their lives. But, you know, he's thought, well, you know, they're, they're probably fine. They've probably come here before. It's probably okay. Besides, I don't want to. I don't want to bother them. You know, that would just be awkward, maybe. Um, so they they continued to play around this waterfall, and the man finished his lunch, and he continued his hike. But as he was finishing his hike, he 
heard helicopter noises above him going back in that same direction. And he got pretty concerned, but after he got home that evening, he began to look on the news, and on the news, he saw the headlines, three boys drown in the river. If you were that man, would you perhaps have some regrets that you would not have done something more to try to help and save those boys? And if you were the parents of those boys, would you, how would you feel if you knew that somebody could have helped your children, but they didn't? Beloved, how must God feel when there's literally billions of his children around the world going astray, playing by the waterfall, that do not home, know him, and we seem to be satisfied to not do everything we can to tell them about Jesus and his love. I want to make a, a very simple appeal. Um, I'm just going to ask you to raise your hand in a minute. You know, maybe you recognize that you have been like those Israelites, one to murmur, one to complain, one who grumbles and who has become discouraged. Maybe you're, you're somebody who has just seen the heart of God in a special way today, and you want to ask God in a special way. You recognize that, Lord, I don't have that heart yet. And you want to ask Jesus to give you that heart again. Maybe you've become discouraged at your lack of results and you've recognized that you've been focusing on self rather than caring for people. And you want to ask God, Lord, I want to serve you not just because it's my duty, but because I actually love people. Would you raise your hand with me and ask God for that new heart? Anybody? Praise the Lord. Well, um, I want to invite up our song service leader now to sing our, our closing hymn. Uh, what is our closing hymn?